Good morning. On behalf of all of us here at the Cooper Institute, we welcome you to our Coffee with Cooper virtual series that focuses on taking control of your life and working towards a healthier future. This series presents up-to-date health and wellness information and offers suggestions for healthier living based on proven science. I am Laura Defina, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Cooper Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Cooper Institute, Dr. Kenneth H. Cooper, the father of aerobics, established the Cooper Institute nonprofit in 1970 to promote lifelong health and wellness worldwide through research, education, and advocacy. By improving public health, the Cooper Institute helps people live better, longer lives now and well into the future. It is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Sonia Merrill, sleep medicine physician for the Cooper Clinic. Dr. Merrill received her Master of Arts in Medical Ethics and Law and a doctorate in Philosophy from the University of London before completing her medical degree at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Merrill completed an internal medicine residency at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas and subsequently completed a sleep medicine fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. She is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and Sleep Medicine. Today, Dr. Merrill is discussing the causes, diagnosis, and treatment of sleep apnea, as well as its health consequences. We will have a few minutes at the end for her to answer questions you have submitted in advance. You can also use the Q&A function in Zoom. Please know that we will get to as many of the questions as possible. Dr. Merrill, welcome to Coffee with Cooper. I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Dafina. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you this morning uh, regarding obstructive sleep apnea. So just as a point of introduction, sleep problems are really very common. In fact, many of you watching may have a sleep disorder yourself or live with someone who does. Unfortunately though, sleep disorders may not be recognized either by the patient or by their physician or it may just not be a topic that they feel comfortable bringing up with their doctor. So why is this the case? Well, for one thing, many people just underestimate the importance of a good night of sleep for their health and overall well-being. People will say things like, oh, I just don't need that much sleep, you know, or I've just always been a, a light sleeper, it's just how I am. Or, you know, it's just snoring, it's just bothering my wife, it doesn't really affect me, why should I? Why should I raise this with my doctor? So those are some of the rationalizations uh, that, that people often will, will uh, provide for not really focusing on their sleep or bringing it up in the consultation with their doctors. The other thing is the field of sleep medicine is relatively new. It really didn't take off until the 1980s. And I can tell you just looking back, you know, in my time in medical school in the 90s, I don't remember any any lectures at all or any training at all in sleep medicine at that time. And then even in my residency, uh, very few, um, very few lectures on, on sleep disorders and sleep medicine. So I think many physicians are just uh, not really uh, uh, prepared to, to recognize, to diagnose, to, to treat sleep problems. It's just been almost a, a black hole, so to speak, in the, the curriculum in medical school and in residency training. So before we start talking about today's topic of obstructive sleep apnea, I just want to mention a few other or a few common sleep disorders, including sleep apnea. So um, one of the things that you know, I think everybody's experienced at some point in their life is insomnia, which means trouble falling or staying asleep or waking earlier in the morning than you would like. This happens to all of us from time to time, maybe in a time of stress, or if we forget and have you know, too much caffeine too late in the evening, or perhaps when we're traveling in a 
another country in a different time zone and we have trouble sleeping. So I think we can all identify with this, but in true insomnia, chronic insomnia is, is really a, a, a very serious and debilitating condition. Um, sleep apnea, which we're going to talk about today, is, is characterized just very briefly as pauses in breathing during sleep, often associated with snoring, but not always. Come back to that later. Uh, another sleep disorder that people don't always recognize as falling in the realm of sleep medicine is restless leg syndrome. Uh, restless legs are, are basically uh, creepy crawly or uncomfortable, strange sensations in the legs, typically in the feet or the lower legs associated with an urge to move the legs. And that can make it hard to fall asleep because you're just so restless and trying to, to move around to relieve this, this odd sensation, this urge to, to move. And then a similar disorder, a related disorder is periodic limb movement disorder. This is something that often the patient is not aware of. The bed partner may uh, be aware because the patient's legs are twitching, uh, jerking, kicking, uh, rhythmically every few seconds, every seven seconds, every 10 seconds during their sleep. And this is something that we will see when we do a sleep study and it can disturb um, the, the quality of rest. So I've termed the, the diagnoses on this slide, um, a few zebras. So in medicine, when something is an unusual diagnosis, it's something that we don't see very often, we call it a zebra. So I put the three Zs there because it's sleep. So it says zebras. Um, these disorders uh, include REM sleep behavior disorder, which is essentially acting out dreams while you're still asleep. Um, that can be dangerous if you um, are fighting in the dream or kicking a soccer ball or something like that, and you actually do those actions and, and hurt yourself or your loved one. Um, sleepwalking, more benign, uh, is very common in children, not very common in adults. Adults typically don't do this. Uh, but just getting out of bed and wandering around the house during the night and then typically peacefully, you know, returning to the bed or falling asleep, staying asleep there on the, on the sofa and finding yourself there the next day. Sleep paralysis. This will happen at least once, probably to uh, a third of the population in the lifetime. It's waking up usually on your back with the sensation of, you know, being awake, but unable to move. You can breathe, but you can't move any of your other muscles. Um, the last two uh, sleep problems on this slide are related. They both are disorders of excessive sleepiness in the daytime. Narcolepsy is characterized by sudden sleep attacks uh, that basically come out of nowhere. The patient will feel very drowsy and have a hard time resisting sleep. And these little sleep attacks may last just for a few seconds or a few minutes, but they may be recurrent and happens, for instance, when driving. And this is a disorder that starts in young people and is a lifelong problem that's treated with medication. And then the last uh, disorder is what we call idiopathic hypersomnia. Idiopathic, that term in medicine means we just haven't figured out what causes it yet. And so these are folks that, that are really sleepy in the daytime. They may sleep a long time at night, 10 or 12 hours at night. They may take three or four hour naps. We do all sorts of testing to rule out these other sleep disorders that I've mentioned, and we find nothing, but we know that these people are very, very sleepy. And, um, you know, there's ongoing research looking into the causes of that. So, so those are just some of the common sleep disorders and some of the more unusual ones. So let's talk about sleep apnea. And the, the two types of sleep apnea are central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, central sleep apnea is, is quite rare. It's less than 1% of the US population. And um, obstructive sleep apnea, on the other hand, is much more common. It uh, affects about 10 to, to 30% of the US population. So central sleep apnea, we'll just have, have one, I think just one slide on that because it's not as common. It is a neurological problem. It is a problem with the brain's respiratory center, uh, essentially not sending the proper signals to the breathing muscles. So there's a lack of initiation of, of a breath, lack of coordination of breathing that results in a pause in, in breathing just due to lack of respiratory effort. This um, condition is most commonly seen in people who have one of the following um, other disorders or conditions, congestive heart failure. Uh, this is a very common um, association that we see in people with heart failure, central sleep apnea. 
uh, and also in neurological disorders. So stroke, for instance, uh, somebody who's had a stroke subsequently is at risk for central sleep apnea. And uh, also those that have a brain injury, a brain tumor, something like that uh, are at greater risk for central sleep apnea. And then finally, in, in our society, there are many people who have chronic pain, unfortunately, and have to take opiates on a, on a daily or nightly basis. Other people who just take them, you know, after an injury or a surgery briefly, but opiate pain medications such as hydrocodone, oxycodone, even tramadol do also provoke this problem with, with breathing central sleep apnea. So the focus of today's talk is obstructive sleep apnea. So what is obstructive sleep apnea and how does it occur? What causes it? So during sleep, we have a relaxation of all the muscles in the body. The muscle tone is very decreased. If you've ever picked up a sleeping uh, baby or, or a toddler or dog or cat, you will remember how heavy and how floppy the limbs feel. Uh, and this is because of the loss of muscle tone during sleep that occurs with all of us. So when the muscle tone is decreased, that permits the upper airway to, to block and to collapse. If the airway is smaller, the patient is more risk than if the airway is larger. So it's just simple. I tell my patients it's just simple plumbing. A smaller pipe is more easily blocked than a larger pipe. And so if your airway is, is smaller, more crowded, um, you are more at risk for this collapse uh, of the airway during sleep. And when the airway collapses and blocks for at least 10 seconds at a time, that's what we call an apnea. And during that period, the oxygen saturation drops, less oxygen reaches the bloodstream, and of course, all the organs in the body, and particularly the brain is very sensitive to lack of oxygen. So what happens is as this uh, oxygen saturation drops and the brain realizes, hey, we're, we're not getting as much oxygen, breathing is abnormal, it actually triggers the, the brain to wake up or have what we call technically an arousal from sleep for just a few seconds. And what that does is enables us to get the muscle tone back to the normal level of muscle tone that we experience in wakefulness so that the airway can be unblocked. And then at that point, the patient goes right back to sleep, has no awareness typically that any of this is happening. So this cycle repeats over and over again throughout the night. And if there are at least five of these episodes of blockage per hour of sleep, that is how we diagnose obstructive sleep apnea. If there are 30 or more of these episodes per hour during sleep, then that is considered severe obstructive sleep apnea. Because each time there is an apnea event, the uh, person wakes up very briefly, this produces a very um, unrefreshing, interrupted, fragmented sleep. And in the morning, people will often wake up feeling very groggy, unrefreshed, like they didn't really rest. And that sleepiness even may linger throughout the day and, and cause problems for them. So I have a few slides here just showing the, um, the, the airway. Um, and you can see here's a normal airway. So here's the person on their back and uh, the, the tongue here. And here is the oral airway where the blue is going. I think the blue is just meant to show air. And then the nasal airway here. And you can see how the air is able to Trans, transmit all the way down into the, the throat. In this patient who has a blocked airway, you see the airflow stops. The tongue is actually rolled back and blocked off the airway here. And so there is no air getting past. And what you'll see is that the nasal airway also joins in with the oral airway back here. And it's also not, the airflow from the, the, the nostrils is also not able to, to reach all the way down into the throat. So dentists are actually on the front lines of looking for this problem. And what your dentist might see while examining you is something like this. So if you have a normal airway, you have a normal sized uvula, which is this here, and the soft palate here. Tonsils are here and they're relatively small. And in fact, in adults, oftentimes they're what we call involuted or shrunken and shriveled up so we don't even see them. And of course, many people have had surgeries when they're children to remove tonsils. 
Now in, in this uh, picture, you can see how the soft palate is longer and the uvula is longer and it's actually starting to come down and touch the tongue. The tongue also looks, looks larger and just beefier. And you can kind of see the tonsils right on the side there. So this is a moderately crowded airway. This is not as crowded as in some, in some patients that I see, but it definitely, you can see the, the space here, of the airway is much larger than the space here. So what are some of the symptoms at night while you're sleeping that you might experience or uh, in some cases, the person sleeping with you might notice? Snoring is the classic, obviously. Snoring is just the vibration of the soft palate in the back of the mouth. So when air hits the soft palate, it vibrates and the snoring sound results. Sometimes there's actual gasping and choking and pauses in breathing that the bed partner will witness. Rarely, I would say, maybe only five to 10% of the patients that I see actually come to the office themselves saying, I'm waking up gasping or choking or not breathing. Rarely do uh, people have that awareness themselves, but it will be observed sometimes you know, by their loved one. Or also I see this uh, quite often, you know, I get referrals after a patient has had a procedure like a colonoscopy where they've been sedated and the anesthesiologist has observed these pauses in their breathing. Restless sleep is very common. So usually the person with sleep apnea will have no trouble falling asleep, but they may feel like their sleep is light and they're very restless. Night sweats are another thing that we see in people with sleep apnea, typically affecting the, the neck and the uh, torso more than the rest of the body. Frequent urination, this is a very common problem. In fact, one of my urology colleagues has told me that he thinks probably 90% of what we call nocturia or urinary frequency at night is actually due to a sleep disorder and not due to a urologic disorder. So, uh, you know, it may be normal as you get older or if a man has an enlarged prostate to go maybe once a night, but if you're going two, three, four times a night, this may be a symptom of sleep apnea. Acid reflux is more common, especially at night in people with sleep apnea, as is teeth grinding. Daytime symptoms include waking up with a dry mouth, having a headache when you wake up from the disruption of your sleep and the lack of oxygen, just feeling groggy, um, as I described earlier. And then throughout the day, having trouble focusing, concentrating, uh, getting things done, lack of motivation, uh, being forgetful, uh, forgetting where you put your keys, forgetting somebody's name, uh, personality changes, being more irritable, being more moody. Um, and uh, particularly in men, we see impotence is, is a real issue for um, uh, men with sleep apnea. And then the excessive daytime sleepiness. So uh, I want everybody just to take a, a, a couple of minutes and look at this slide and, and complete uh, in your head or on a piece of paper if you have it nearby. Uh, what we call the Epworth sleepiness scale. This is a, a scale that we use routinely in my office and in pretty much every sleep specialist clinic. And so the questions below different situations, you can read there. I'm not gonna read them out loud on the screen because you can see them. Please answer them in the daytime, not, you know, so say from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in that time frame. Would there be a zero chance of dozing in that situation, a slight chance, a moderate or a high chance? And I'm gonna give you one minute just to read through the questions and do a quick quiz for yourselves. Okay, I think that was about a minute. I should have been timing, but um, so if you had a score of at least 10 points altogether on that questionnaire, you have a clearly elevated level of daytime sleepiness that should 
prompt you to think about, you know, do you have a sleep disorder? Um, maybe you're just not allowing enough time to sleep and you're chronically getting, you know, five or six hours instead of the seven or eight that you need. But certainly a score of 10 or more is abnormal. And in some cases, uh, we will see scores in the, in the mid to high teens or even into the 20s in people with severe obstructive sleep apnea. The maximum is 24, by the way, eight times three. So the consequences of sleep apnea uh, are considerable and really the daytime sleepiness is a big problem. It may lead to uh, problems such as being late to work or to school because it's so hard to wake up in the morning, uh, impaired productivity at work and school just because of the lack of ability to focus, missing out on things you'd like to do because you're too tired. So actually, you know, turning down invitations on a Saturday to go out with, with friends or, um, you know, go out, going out to work in your yard because you're just too tired to do those things. And then the most serious consequence of daytime sleepiness is falling asleep at the wheel. In fact, this is the thing we worry most about with people with obstructive sleep apnea in the immediate term in terms of um, the lethality of the condition is, is a, a sleep attack basically at, at the wheel. And this happens, unfortunately, at times in people who are in the transportation industry, like train drivers and truck drivers, and you hear about these horrific crashes that kill a lot of people because of this. And then another consequence of sleep apnea is relationship problems. I hear this all the time. You know, snoring can actually get you kicked out of bed. And there are couples that have not slept together in years because one or the other uh, person is, is such a bad snorer and it's just so disruptive. So some of the medical complications of sleep apnea, high blood pressure, very, very common, probably the most common medical consequence of sleep apnea that we see. Um, heart disease, so coronary artery disease, which is blockages in the arteries that feed blood to the heart muscle. And when those blockages occur, that's what we call a heart attack. Heart rhythm problems, electrical problems with the heart. You've probably heard of atrial fibrillation or may have that condition yourself. Very um, uh, close association there with obstructive sleep apnea being a provoking factor for AFib. Stroke, uh, again, a higher risk of stroke in people with obstructive sleep apnea. Insulin resistance, which is the mechanism of adult onset or type 2 diabetes, is more common in people with sleep apnea. Obesity. Now, obesity is, obesity is a risk factor for having obstructive sleep apnea, but it also, having obstructive sleep apnea can predispose to obesity um, because chronically interrupted sleep disrupts the uh, hormones that actually regulate our appetite, control our appetite, and also prevent us from having the energy to exercise. Dementia, this is something that we're all concerned about as we're living longer. Alzheimer's and other types of dementia also are more commonly seen in people with a history of obstructive sleep apnea. And then finally, if you're going in for what seems like a rather routine procedure, uh, like a knee replacement, et cetera, um, just the anesthesia uh, coming out of the anesthesia may be more problematic for you if you have obstructive sleep apnea. And it's always important to let the surgeon and anesthesiologist know if you have this condition. It can also be uh, more dangerous in patients who are taking certain medications that will cause more airway collapse like muscle relaxants or the opiate medicines we talked about earlier also can worsen obstructive sleep apnea as well as triggering the central apnea. So how do we screen somebody uh, for sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea? So really a good history, having a good conversation with the patient and then a, a physical exam. So we already talked about the symptoms and then we've seen the pictures of this crowded upper airway. Large neck circumference is actually a, a well-known and well-documented uh, means of screening um, for obstructive sleep apnea in men, a neck circumference of 17 inches or more, and women 16. Uh, those are folks that are at more risk for upper, upper airway obstruction, uh, people who are obese, and then also the presence uh, of high blood pressure. So one of the things that can be done, say, in the dent from the dentist's office or the primary care office, if there's some concern, is just screening with what we call home oximetry, overnight oximetry, just a little finger clip 
uh, device on the fingernail that measures the blood oxygen level. And if that is abnormal, referral may be needed. A lot of times though, it's just the symptoms alone that are enough to trigger a referral for, for uh, further testing. So the gold standard for evaluating sleep apnea, and in fact, most sleep disorders is a sleep study. And the technical term for this is a polysomnogram, or we talk about doing polysomnography. And this is monitoring the sleep in a lab setting. So we have electrodes that are placed on the scalp to measure the brain's electrical activity. That tells us if the patient is awake, asleep, what stage of sleep, even if they're waking up for five or 10 seconds at a time. We know all of that from those uh, electrodes. We also have electrodes placed on the face by the eyes to show rapid eye movements, which occur during rapid eye movement stage of sleep. There's another electrode on the chin right about here that measures the muscle tone in the chin. And then we have electrodes, EKG electrodes on the chest to measure the heart rate and rhythm. And then finally electrodes on the calf muscles to uh, let us see if the patient is moving frequently during sleep and having what I referred to earlier, what we call periodic limb movements. In terms of measuring the breathing on a sleep study, there's a, there's a breathing sensor, what we call a, a cannula or a thermistor that's placed uh, between the nose and the mouth. We also have two small belts around the chest and abdomen that enable us to measure the effort that uh, the patient is making to breathe during sleep. The oxygen sensor, again, that we discussed already that can be done at home, but is more accurate when done in the sleep lab. And then audio and video recording just to see what position the patient's sleeping in. Are they uh, talking in their sleep? Are they moving uh, a lot, et cetera? Snoring, of course. So this is um, just a, a cartoon of what um, the hookup, so to speak, is what we talk, call it in the sleep lab, looks like just all of the, the wires and, and, and monitors there. The only thing that's not showing in this image is the breathing uh, sensor there between the nose and mouth. None of this is painful, by the way, or invasive. All of these are just surface electrodes, and it takes about 30 minutes to an hour to get everything connected uh, when you go for a sleep study, but after that, it's, it's not really an uncomfortable um, you know, experience. However, um, for some patients, it's more convenient for them or more cost effective to do some form of testing at home. And so the home sleep test is certainly simpler. It's much less expensive. And for some patients, they prefer to be at home in their own bed. It's more convenient for them, maybe if they have child care or pet care issues. Um, but the limitation really is that these tests the vast majority of them do not measure sleep. They only measure breathing. And they don't tell us anything else about the sleep other than what is the breathing pattern. And therefore the results are not as comprehensive and they're not as accurate. So certainly if somebody has other sleep disorders like insomnia or we suspect periodic limb movements or that REM sleep behavior disorder, or perhaps the patient you know, is very obese or maybe has a, you know, congestive heart failure. These are not patients who do well in a home test environment. They really need to be studied in the sleep lab. These are just some pictures of various devices that are used at home for home sleep apnea testing. And we have at Cooper uh, several of these types of uh, devices, including the one in the upper left corner that we use. So let's talk a little bit about treatment then, because you know, there's no point in making a diagnosis if we don't have any intent of, of treating the patient. So the, the first thing that's always important to understand is that in the majority of patients with obstructive sleep apnea, they tend to be overweight. They may just be slightly overweight, 15, 20 pounds, or they may have you know, significant weight challenges being 100 pounds or more overweight. Certainly we know that being overweight is a major risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea. However, there are plenty of people who do not have any uh, issue with their weight, their body mass index, their BMI is entirely normal, and they have 
this upper airway obstruction just because their airway is small to start with often. It's a hereditary issue in those cases. And of course, in those situations, weight loss is, is not relevant. But for the majority of Americans, at least, who have this diagnosis, weight loss will improve uh, the outcome. Now, will it cure obstructive sleep apnea? Can it be cured with weight loss is a good question. Um, and one that many of you might have. Well, I can certainly tell you in my experience over the years that in, in those folks that are very, very overweight who perhaps have a gastric bypass surgery and lose 100 pounds or more with that surgery, when we retest them, we find that they have uh, resolved their apnea. But that is not the majority of folks. The majority of folks that are 30 or 40 pounds overweight that, that go on a diet, uh, make healthy lifestyle changes and lose the weight, uh, when we retest them, we find the apnea has improved, but it has not resolved. So, you know, weight loss may be curative, but I can never promise that to a patient up front. We always have to retest them after they reach a normal BMI just to verify. In some cases, um, avoiding sleeping on your back may be all that you need doing a sleep study and finding out that you have, you know, 25 times an hour that you stop breathing on your back, but only two or three times an hour when you're on your left or right side, that's what we call positional obstructive sleep apnea, where it's happening really exclusively in the supine or back position. And those patients, if we take active measures to keep them off of their backs, that may help. And there are several uh, types of positioning pillows that one can buy um, that will basically strap onto uh, the waist and, and have, have a, a bump in, in your back, basically a foam wedge or uh, something similar that will help you to not sleep on your back consistently and reliably. And there have been studies looking at the effectiveness of those, and they are very effective if used properly. An oral appliance is uh, another uh, type of treatment for sleep apnea. We'll talk more about that in, in a few minutes. I have more slides on, on the last um, four um, treatments, the appliance, the CPAP, the surgery, and the nerve stimulator. So CPAP is the gold standard for treating sleep apnea. However, as I mentioned before, you know, sleep medicine, the field is really only dating back to the 1980s. And this is actually one of the reasons why uh, it was not such a, a popular or well-known specialty prior is that we knew that people were not breathing normally during sleep, but there was not a great treatment for them other than very aggressive surgeries, including back in the day, actually tracheostomies to bypass the obstruction in the upper airway. So in 1981, CPAP was first used, and it's really changed, revolutionized the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and therefore the field of sleep medicine. It's the most consistently effective treatment that we have. It usually reduces the number of apneas to less than five per hour or normal breathing. And the machine is basically a compressor. It's using airway pressure. Uh, applying that pressure through a, a, a tubing and a mask that goes uh, in the nose or over the nose and mouth. And that column of air pressure keeps the airway open during sleep. So in terms of figuring out what level of air pressure is needed for this, what we prefer to do is do, uh, do this in the sleep lab setting, do what we call a titration study. And we can do this either as a second night after a full night of diagnostic testing, we can do a second full night of titration of the pressure, or we can do what's called a split night protocol, where the first two to three hours of a sleep study is the diagnostic portion, and then we uh, adjust the CPAP settings on the second half of the night if the patient is sleeping well enough and long enough to do that. For some patients, we opt instead of this in-lab titration to, do, um, to, to order a machine for them to use at home. It's called an auto CPAP or an auto titrating CPAP. And this machine can be programmed at a range of pressures and the machine will detect if you're having apnea and will gradually increase the pressure until the blockage is open. And then after the airway is open for some time, the machine will gradually reduce the pressure. So it's regulating the pressure based on your breathing. This is what uh, we are increasingly using uh, for the sake of uh, cost, convenience, and now um, just to get people on treatment sooner. 
the great thing about CPAP, other than its high, high level of effectiveness and the fact that it's non-invasive, it doesn't require any, any surgery, doesn't really have any potential to cause harm, um, is that we can get the data from the CPAP machine and monitor the progress of the patient objectively. And increasingly, patients are also using apps that are designed for their um, uh, edification, I guess you could say, so that they are able to, to track how they're doing with their CPAP and their breathing and their sleep. And I can even make adjustments in the pressure setting of the machine remotely if a, if a patient calls and has a question or concern and I look at their data remotely and then can make a change to make the treatment more effective. So these are some pictures of a CPAP and you'll see uh, this one down here in the bottom left is the latest generation uh, by ResMed, the 11 series. And this is the, the ResMed travel uh, machine, the Air Mini. It's less than a pound and you can see it in comparison to some keys. It's really a small uh, portable machine. And then these two pictures show different types of masks. This one goes under the nose. It's kind of a nasal cradle cushion. And then this one goes over the nose, as you can see there. And there are probably a hundred different masks now on the market. So there's really something for everyone. And I'm sure I'll get questions about those in a few minutes. So some of the challenges with, with CPAP, I've talked about the positive things about it, but what are some of the challenges that people experience? It's um, sometimes difficult for, for people to tolerate the pressure. They may feel claustrophobic with the mask on. They may have some difficulty breathing out. And just having something on their face may make it harder for them to sleep if they already have insomnia. However, I would say more commonly, I encounter uh, you know, issues with the mask, finding the right type of mask. So um, just discomfort, having something on your, your face, um, something on the bridge of the nose that may be pressing down. That's where it's great to have the, the one I just showed in the previous slide where it just goes under the nose, doesn't put any pressure on the bridge. Skin irritation though can occur in, in, in some people that just have very sensitive skin. And then air leakage can be, can be challenging to manage. Just the noise of the air escaping from the mask or sometimes air actually leaking up uh, into the eyes and drying out the eyes. So this is, if we encounter uh, problems with the mask, what we do is we work with the patient to find an alternative. As I said, there are about a hundred different ones. So usually after the second or third attempt, we find something that's tolerable and comfortable. Nasal problems can, can also impede use of CPAP. Ideally, we should be breathing through our noses all the time, including when we're asleep, but sometimes with allergies or uh, nasal obstruction from a deviated septum, there may be an issue with that. And so congestion, uh, nosebleeds, dry nose, those are, those are things that we have to address and, and can be usually pretty easily addressed with the help of medication or sometimes a referral to an ear, nose and throat doctor to help us out. Nasal congestion is, is often uh, improved by using the humidification, which is built into every CPAP machine. And that moist air helps to decongest and open the nose. Sometimes there's a problem with the spouse uh, finding it loud or just not liking their partner having, you know, a mask on their face and this, you know, kind of tongue in cheek comment I have at the bottom doesn't make a great fashion statement. Well, this is why, you know, you're probably not broadcasting your sleep every night, you know, on your, um, you know, uh, YouTube channel or whatever. Um, but, but there are occasions where it, it is challenging for the, the bed partner um, to sleep with somebody with CPAP, but in the vast majority of cases, it's the opposite. Usually the bed partner is so relieved and happy that their, their partner is no longer snoring and gasping and stopping breathing that they are really glad that the, uh, their loved one is using a CPAP. So let's talk about another uh, type of treatment, which is oral appliance. This is a dental appliance that opens and stabilizes the upper airway by repositioning the mandible, the lower part of the jaw, just bringing it forward. This is only appropriate in mild to moderate cases and not in severe sleep apnea because it only reduces the number of events of apnea by about 50%. It tends to work better in younger non-obese patients who have uh, you know, perhaps a, a smaller neck size, and um, you know, they, they, they may not have a long soft palate. They may just have this uh, jaw, uh, recessed jaw that, that is causing the obstruction. So by bringing it forward, that may help. 
And uh, it can be used in conjunction with the, the positioning pillows we talked about earlier. So the appliance is something that um, is not as effective as I mentioned as CPAP, but in some cases better tolerated. And we don't have the same dynamic way of measuring the effectiveness like we do with CPAP. So what happens is if you use an appliance, periodically you need to have a, another home sleep test uh, or a sleep study in the lab done using the appliance to make sure that it's actually working. These are some pictures of appliances. You can see they're, they all are basically comprised of two pieces that it hooked together, either as a hinge in, in the back of the mouth or in this case, the tap. Uh, there's a, a little screw in here and, and, a, and a hook that, and then a little pin that, as you can see here, is used to bring the lower jaw forward. Some of the challenges with an appliance, uh, some people experience excessive salivation. They wake up with a lot of drool on their pillow. Uh, more seriously can be a, a malocclusion or a dental misalignment with a change in bite that can actually be permanent over, over years. Shifting of the teeth pain in the jaw joint, the temporomandibular joint. And um, some people just can't tolerate having something in their mouth. So if you've tried to use an appliance for clenching or grinding and you spit it out, you can't use it, this is not gonna work for you. And then as I already mentioned, we can't really track the effectiveness as well. Moving on to talk about upper airway surgery. This is indicated really only in patients that have a specific underlying anatomic abnormality that we think is causing obstructive sleep apnea. And the type of surgery depends on the location of the blockage. So um, I'm not gonna go into this in much detail, but certainly in the back of the, the mouth and the back of the throat, as I showed some pictures earlier, the palate may be long, the uvula may be long and thick. And those are, are soft tissue structures that can be removed, um, basically trimmed to make more space. Um, in other patients, there is a problem really at the level of the base of the tongue. And in those cases, it's uh, necessary to do a more radical surgery, what we call a maxillomandibular advancement, basically bringing the jaw forward, bringing the tongue therefore also forward uh, and unblocking the airway. This is a very um, long uh, recovery period from both of these surgeries, uh, usually a week or two of discomfort and, and really being off work, you know, for, for these types of procedures, not being able to eat uh, during that period of time other than, than liquids. Uh, there's another procedure that can move the tongue muscle forward. And that uh, may be helpful in some patients, but again, I don't see very many patients where they have just one of these anatomic problems. They usually have multiple or it's weight related. And, and so they're not going to benefit from these, these types of procedures. Nasal blockage can be alleviated much more simply with a polypectomy or a, a nasal septal repair, turbinectomy, those procedures that are office-based and very well tolerated, but are not going to actually resolve the obstructive sleep apnea, just make it easier for people to tolerate a CPAP with an, a nasal mask. So the last treatment that I'm going to discuss is the implantable nerve stimulator. And right now there's only one that's FDA approved and available in the United States, and it's called Inspire. You may have seen the commercials for it on television. It's FDA approved for patients who have tried and failed CPAP, who have a body mass index uh, less than 33, and have a moderate to severe level of sleep apnea. The number of apneas per hour has to be between 15 and 65 to qualify for this treatment. This is an upper airway stimulator that acts like a pacemaker to stabilize the breathing muscles in the airway. So there are a couple of incisions. There's an incision in the chest wall, kind of like with a pacemaker, there's a little pocket that's created and the neurostimulator is implanted there. And then there is another incision in the neck and there are pressure sensing and stimulation leads that run up basically in the neck and stimulate the upper airway muscles. The stimulator is controlled by the patient with a little handheld device. And this is obviously very convenient for people. They don't have to carry a CPAP around with them or even the dental appliance. So uh, it's, it's billed as kind of a cure for sleep apnea as opposed to these other things, which are treatments that you have to use on an ongoing basis. These are just some pictures of what it looks like. Again, a cartoon here showing the neurostimulator where it's implanted in the right upper chest. And then there's the leads, there's a sensing lead there, and then the stimulation lead, the one that goes up the neck. 
This is what the device actually looks like that's implanted and you can see it in reference to a, a quarter. And then here's the remote control. So some of the challenges with this treatment, there's a lengthy qualification and approval process, certainly with insurance. It's very expensive otherwise, if you were to pay out of pocket in the tens of thousands of dollars. And so most people do elect to do this with their insurance. More meaningfully from a medical standpoint, this does require going under anesthesia twice, once during the qualification process and then for the surgery itself. One other step in qualification is going through what's called a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Many of you have probably had an endoscopy looking for ulcers in your stomach or you know, scars from acid reflux. And this is the same type of procedure is, is basically having you um, put to sleep with a you know, intravenous uh, sedative. And then the scope is put down in the airway to look at the type of collapse pattern. And based on the type of collapse pattern of the airway, you may or may not be a candidate. So you have to go through that and jump that hurdle before having the surgery. So therefore you're under anesthesia twice. The second time for general anesthesia with the surgery. Always with any surgery, we have the risk of infection. Uh, in this case, the incisions are also in cosmetically visible areas. So for people who do have um, a tendency to scar, form keloid scars, this is probably not ideal because you'll have an incision in your chest and another on your neck that will be visible. Devices, um, the devices can't be used for at least four weeks afterward just to give them time to, to heal uh, in, graft in. And then at that point, the patient returns to the surgeon, they turn on the device and start making adjustments to the amount of um, stimulation that, that is provided to be comfortable and effective. This device does have a battery and it will need to be changed approximately every 11 years. So think about that up front that you will have to have another minor procedure down the road, uh, depending on your age, maybe several times if you use this for, for decades. Some patients experience discomfort that limits use. There's a, there's a buzzing or vibration kind of sensation in the throat that many people find uh, at least noticeable and in some cases bothersome and, and they'll turn the stimulator off during the night if they have that, uh, that occur. And then of course they don't get the benefit from it the rest of the night. And then finally, it's not as effective as CPAP in reducing the number of apneas. Most of the time we'll see uh, the reduction in apnea being anywhere from 50, maybe to 70%. So if you start with 40 episodes an hour, you might get down to 10 or 15 uh, per hour with the Inspire, as opposed to 40 per hour with the CPAP, usually we'll see down to one or two events per hour. So it's more effective than the other surgeries that I mentioned and more effective than the appliance, but not as effective as CPAP. Okay, so in conclusion, um, sleep disorders are under-recognized and hence under-treated in the general population. One of the most common sleep disorders is obstructive sleep apnea. As we saw earlier, between 10 to 30% of the US population, it affects men and women. It affects children all the way up to the elderly. It has serious consequences for daytime functioning and overall health. We've seen that it can be very easily diagnosed either at home or in a sleep lab setting. And there are a variety of treatment options available. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And Dr. Dafina, I think has some questions for me probably. Yes, I do. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Merrill for a really interesting lecture and for your dedication to helping us improve the quality and quantity of uh, life. So yes, there are several questions and in the interest of time, I'm going to pick a couple that I found interesting um, and hopefully our uh, listeners will find interesting. Um, the first questions were related to the sleep study and the question was twofold. One, how do you sleep with all that gear on? And two, how do you go to the bathroom with all that gear on? And with those two questions, how does it reflect a real night's sleep? That's a great question. And I get that, that oftentimes asked me in the office 
when I'm proposing to do a sleep study. So um, first of all, you know, how, how do you sleep with all of those, those electrodes on? I, I can tell you, I, I did a sleep study during my training because I wanted to experience it myself. And yes, I mean, certainly you are aware of having the, the different uh, pieces of equipment attached, but none of them is, is uncomfortable or painful. Um, it, it may be uh, akin to trying to sleep with your glasses on or trying to sleep with your socks and shoes on. It's something that you're aware of and you feel uh, maybe a little bit unnatural, but it's not uh, that inhibiting of, of the ability to sleep. Um, for patients who, who have a concern about uh, whether, you know, maybe they're a sensitive uh, person, having things on their face may bother them, uh, particularly if they've had trouble with insomnia as well, and maybe they don't sleep well in a different environment, we will actually even provide a sleeping pill for them to take. And there have been some clinical trials looking at this and, uh, you know, taking a sleep aid on the night of a sleep study and actually at home for several weeks after starting CPAP therapy, those patients tend to be more adherent to CPAP down the road. So there's some precedent, you know, even evidence-based to have people take a sleep aid if they have some uh, trepidation about doing the sleep study. In the vast majority of, of cases, though, people tell me afterward, you know, it really wasn't as bad as I thought. You know, it was, it was kind of interesting, you know, to have, have all these wires and they'll put pictures of themselves, you know, on their Instagram or Facebook, you know, with all the, the, the monitoring equipment. Um, but it's, it's for some people difficult. And even at home, it can be difficult, um, you know, because there is some equipment still attached. So, um, you know, in terms of going to the bathroom, all of the wires are attached to a little box, just a little, what we call a head box. And so that box is attached to the, the, the cabling that runs, you know, in the, into the wall in the sleep lab. So rather than taking all the electrodes off, the technologist comes into the room and just unplugs that. And so you just go into the bathroom with all of your electrodes still attached to you, but not attached to the, to the monitor that's transmitting the, the, the data. So um, it's very common, as I mentioned, in sleep apnea patients to have to go several times to the bathroom during the night. So the techs are very good in the sleep lab at recognizing and helping with that. Did I cover everything? Was there one other thing? Nope, that was uh, the first question. The second uh, question of interest that several people asked about was pillows. And I know you talked about special pillows to help people not sleep on their back, but in general, if people with their regular pillows, are there any issues with not sleeping on the pillow, ways to move the pillow that people might be able to um, address their apnea without, or address their sleep disturbances without intervention. So can you comment on, on that? I can, I can comment not from a very evidence-based standpoint um, because they're really uh, are not, um, it, it's hard to do clinical trials of different pillows and different mattresses. You certainly can't blind those. You can't blind the patient to what they're using. Um, so it's really a matter of personal preference and often factoring in other conditions that somebody, you know, may have a, you know, bad, bad neck and need a cervical support, um, may have acid reflux and do well with a wedge pillow, something that elevates them. Just as a general principle, though, with obstructive sleep apnea, being more elevated, keeping the head more elevated is beneficial and will slightly reduce the, the number of, of obstructive events. And so what I do tell people is if they're in a situation where they don't have their CPAP machine, maybe the power's gone out in their house or something uh, the second half of the night in a storm, like we get here in Dallas very often, try to prop yourself up in the bed as much as possible. If you have an adjustable bed, those are great. You can get a lot of elevation of your, your head um, that way. Um, but also then using several pillows if, if, if need be, that does slightly reduce the severity of the obstructive sleep apnea, but in, it, it would not be considered a, a standalone treatment, I guess I could say. Um, you know, in terms of another way that a pillow may interact with the conversation about obstructive sleep apnea, for some people, as they try to sleep on their side with a CPAP mask, especially if it covers the mouth and nose or even just the nose, if they're trying to sleep on their side and it hits into their pillow, that, that may dislodge the mask. And there are special CPAP contour pillows that have little carve outs on the side of the, of the, the pillow um, to accommodate the mask. So 
pillows definitely come up in the conversation uh, that I have with my patients, but never really as a standalone treatment to try to address sleep apnea, you know, without a CPAP or without a dental appliance. Excellent. Um, so we probably have time for about two more questions. And one of the last questions we got, and I think, again, very germane to the time we're living in, is, is there any relation between obstructive sleep apnea and either COVID-19 or long haul COVID-19? So we're learning more and more about this. And certainly with the long haul, I think we still got a lot, a long ways to go to understand what that really means what is that condition and and you know how does it affect people it seems to have a myriad of manifestations um there there are, in terms of the risk of having covid um, and having a severe case of covid um, certainly obesity is a common risk factor for a bad outcome with covid as well as as for sleep apnea so we we, we certainly you know see that patient population who's overweight um, doing you know having more risk for sleep apnea and also having worse outcomes with COVID. But even independently of weight, there have been some studies showing that having obstructive sleep apnea uh, seems to lead to a, a more severe uh, manifestation uh, of the infection. Uh, on a positive side, I would say patients who have CPAP or BiPAP machines for treating their sleep apnea have told me anecdotally that when they had COVID, they felt like it really helped them to breathe, to have that CPAP, that air pressure blowing into their airway. And they would use it even in the daytime when they were resting and, and not just you know while they were sleeping. Um, but, but certainly there, there seems to be a, you know, a, a worse, a more serious form of illness in people with obstructive sleep apnea than with those who do not have it. And long haul, I don't, I'm not aware of any, any research that's shown that having long haul COVID uh, causes people to develop obstructive sleep apnea or anything like that. I think what it would do is if you had untreated sleep apnea, and then you throw in this condition, which causes a lot of fatigue, you're going to have double fatigue. You're going to have the fatigue from the sleep apnea, but you're then also having the, the post COVID fatigue. So it may be hard to tease that out. Like what? what's what in, in somebody presenting to a clinic with fatigue that's had COVID and may also have sleep apnea symptoms. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Merrill. That was a really insightful and interesting um, presentation. Thank you to our listeners. And we look forward to you joining us for the next Copy with Cooper, uh, which will be in about two months. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Awesome.